thought to yourself, you know, I wonder what good games there actually are on the Nintendo Switch eShop, but I don't, I don't know. I, I always just throw my money at it randomly. Well, I thought I would help you out by trying like a new kind of video on the channel. Something like 10 eShop games worth buying. I don't know. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Maybe in the thumbnail, I'll like hold the Switch with like a stupid face, my mouth open, but you can't see my teeth. And then I'll put like something behind me that looks visually pleasing and hope that maybe, just maybe you click on it. Just kidding, I've done that like 20 times now. This is number 21, I don't know. But you know what is different about this video that those other videos didn't have? Well, in this one, I'm giving away one of these bad boys. That's right, I'm giving away a Nintendo Switch. Well, not just me, actually. Perfect World Entertainment and Panic Button, yes, those two very awesome and legitimate gaming companies approached me and asked if I want to give away a limited edition Nintendo Switch to one of you guys. And I said, um... Yeah, yes, yes, please. Yeah, there's no way I'm saying no. Yes, please. <laughs> so this is a custom Nintendo Switch inspired by Hob, Perfect World Entertainment's game, which recently, just the other day, got ported to the Switch thanks to Panic Button. Oh, and speaking of that game, it's obviously going to be on the list, and we're about to talk about that first up in just a moment, but you also get a download code for that game on the Switch when you win it. If you win it. There's only one. Believe me, there's only one, because I really want one. I wasn't gonna ask, <laughs> it's fine. Just saying, Panic Button and Perfect World, if you have another one lying around at the end of all of this, Mine's kind of wore out for playing all those panic button games, just saying. So if you want to win this limited edition, hob-inspired custom switch, make sure to check that description down below for instructions on how to enter. Oh, and while you're down there, I wouldn't mind if you wanted to hit like and subscribe. I mean, I am giving away a switch and just, I mean, well, technically I'm not, but it kind of, yeah, kind of. Thank you so much, Perfect World Entertainment and Panic Button, for this opportunity. Thank you to all of you guys for watching this video. And now let me just get on with it and talk about Hob first up, and then nine other really great games worth buying. Hob is honestly incredible. And I'm not just saying that. I have no ties here. I'm not being sponsored. I'm not getting any money. I'm not even getting a Switch. One of you guys are, okay? I, I have no stake in this. I legitimately love the game. From the moment I started playing, I was hooked. Not only by the beautiful artwork that is is the game's visuals. Not only the intriguing and intricate character designs, but mostly I was hooked by the level design and the gameplay. I love when a game doesn't hold your hand, when a game barely even teaches you the basics and instead allows you to discover and explore for yourself. And that is exactly what Hob does and it is a joy to play. The game encourages you to learn for yourself while still leaving all the necessary learning tools around the world. Hob never taught me how to jump, how to climb or how to platform, but as soon as I saw this platform twist around, it was so clear what I needed to do. Also, side note, even that big punch he did to spin the platform around was a subtle clue, a hint as to later gameplay mechanics. And that holds true for every single gameplay element or puzzle you find or react with in the game, even the combat. After finding a sword and learning how to swing it, there wasn't much left to teach me that I couldn't discover on my own, developing my own skills as I played and even unlocking more from there. And with no written or spoken dialogue, it is still perfectly clear what the story is and what the conversations between the characters might mean. Whether it's simple hand gestures or something much deeper. And again, I love the game's art direction and design so much. Even beyond the large landscapes filled with so much beauty that even the game itself decides to take screenshots of the best parts for you. But the small details, like gaining a new power up to your arm and seeing the new part being inserted and worked on, it adds an extra layer of depth to everything that is happening to this character. So the game is split between puzzle platforming and action combat with the focus being more on the puzzle platforming side. And in this game that really works as the entire world is like one big puzzle for you to solve. Every part of the game feels fresh, every puzzle different to the last, but with everything you have learned from the previous puzzles playing a part in helping your thought process when it comes to solving the next one. While there isn't as much combat, the controls are tight and responsive. Dodge rolls cancelling out of any attack leads to fast fluid combat and you can mix up your fighting style between shield blocking, instant transmission zipping, swinging your sword like crazy or charging up your 
fist for a huge Superman punch Roman Reigns style. Or Big Show style. Or I guess any wrestler that's ever just punched someone really big. I don't know what I'm saying. Again, Hobbs World to me feels like a giant 5,000 piece puzzle. And the more pieces you put together, the clearer the picture becomes. And every piece you get right makes the adventure even more satisfying. I really, really recommend trying out Hob for yourself. And really, really, really recommend checking that description and maybe winning Hob for yourself on a Hob Switch. Mana Spark is a game that I just kept overlooking on the eShop. Even though it's only 10 bucks and often on sale for half the price, like right now actually. Well, at time of recording this anyway, and <laughs> hold me to that if you're watching this a week later. But for this video, I decided to do my research and I went ahead and grabbed the game and learned, like almost always, I was wrong. Sure, it shares some similarities to games I have played, but Mana Spark has its own little spark of individuality that sets it apart from other games on the eShop and makes it well worth its tiny, teeny, tiny price point. Mana, or Mana, I don't know, I don't know which way to say it, and now I'm thinking about it, I don't even know which way I normally say it, is a dungeon crawler twin stick shooter game with roguelike elements where you use a bow as your main weapon. And using the bow actually takes some practice and skill too. Aiming your shots can be very sensitive, making it easier easy to miss targets, and yeah, I kind of like that. I'm not sure if any of you have actually gone out for a day of archery, but it's not really as easy as just pulling back and firing and, th and that it. Yeah, you actually do have to aim. Also, I kind of love that when you miss, your arrows stay stuck into wherever they hit, leaving a trail of wasted arrows in your wake as you slug through the levels. And this game is hard, really hard. Dying is expected, almost encouraged. As you play through a run, you will find rooms that allow you to temporarily power yourself up for that playthrough you using the coins you have collected on the way. There are so many different kinds of power-ups too, each with their own pros and cons. Oh, and you have a hub world, your camp, where you spend in between death times, and you can also use runes here to permanently improve yourself. Visually, Mana Spark is very solid, but there isn't much variety. Remember, you are buying a budget title. So you will see very similar landscapes throughout all of your playthroughs, but with Mana Spark, it's all about the gameplay, which is a great thing because it has very good gameplay. As I, as I said, just buy it, okay? <laughs> 12 is better than 6 goes for pretty much everything. Tacos, donuts, mouth cold sores. Okay, not everything. But in this game, 12 really is better than 6. I used to be really bad about judging a book by its cover. Actually, reviewing all of these indie games really opened my eyes to the fact that the way a game might look by watching the gameplay and the way a game might actually be to play it are often very completely different things. And this goes both ways too. Watching Anthem, I thought, oh, that must be awesome to play. And then I played it. But in this case, I didn't know how I felt about the gameplay until I played it, and then I fell in love with it. The art style of this game looks like something I would have scribbled in blue ballpoint pen back in my grade 12 notebook. Side note, that was really hard to say. <laughs> would have scribbled in blue ballpoint pen back in my blue ballpoint pen back in my gra- Blue ball- I'm not realizing how funny it is to say those two words together. Blue ballpoint pen back in my grade 12 notebook. Blue ballpoint pen back in my grade 12 notebook. I actually kind of love the art style in its simplicity, and the way the deep red of the bad guy blood sprays across the blue and white levels contrasts fantastically. Also reminds me of that great game Mad World on Wii. The gameplay here is fast, super fast, like fast as hands in the west fast. You fly through these levels with your finger on the trigger, blowing away enemies before they get the chance to do the same to you. There is also stealth elements where you can sneak up on sleeping or unaware enemies and take them out silently, which makes some of the more populated levels a lot easier to deal with if all heck breaks loose. For 10 bucks, this is a perfect pick up and play game on the Switch. Knock out a few levels in your spare time kind of thing. So with all that said, yeehaw! Get to, I regret it. It actually wrote that. Why did I think that was going to be cool? <laughs> uh, okay, before I tell you what this next game is, I want you to see this, and this, and now this. If you didn't know how beautiful both the Unravel games are, hopefully now you have a much better idea. Honestly, I didn't want to put either of these games down until the end, if for no other reason than just to see what jaw-dropping location was coming next. Look, I've told this story a few times on my channel before, but, but I guess I'll tell it at least once more, Miss Swan. Comment down below if you got that reference. When the developer of Unravel took the stage at E3 to announce the first game, his passion for the game he had created was so clear to 
of me. His excitement bubbled over into extreme nervousness as he held out his real life version of the in-game character Yanni, his hands were shaking. He broke my heart and for whatever reason that moment stuck with me and I knew I was going to play his game. And now we have the sequel on Switch and it's even better than the last. You can play two co-op now too and it has to be one of the best co-op games on the Switch by far. Unravel is a platformer and working with a partner you use your yarn in many different ways, interacting with the world to create your own paths. You can swing, dangle, pull, bounce, make bridges, anything and everything you can think of. It's just really fun puzzle platforming that can lead to some hilarious moments while you're playing with a friend or partner. Oh, and if you don't have a friend or partner, I'll be your friend, I'm sorry. But you can also play this game on your own as well. There is a brilliant feature where you can combine the two Yarnies together in a one, so you don't have to platform everything twice like you would have to in most other games of this style. And I love, love, love that idea. So however you want to play this game with whoever you want to play it with, I just highly recommend it. A game I never expected, Blaster Master Zero 2. So recently we had an incredible Nintendo Direct, by far the best indie Direct yet. We saw surprises like Cuphead and a new kind of Zelda-ish game. And one other surprise that should not be overlooked was the sequel to Blaster Master Zero, which dropped the same day as the Direct and it's only $10. That's what I mean. There is so much I could say about this game, but in my limited time window here, I just want to give a little background on the series because it, it's just so cool. The original Blaster Master was one of the best games in the NES library, releasing two years before I was even freaking born in 1988. Fast forward to 2017 and a remaster called Blaster Master Zero was released on Switch and 3DS and it was fan freaking tastic I mean, the 3DS had a huge library at that point, but it was one of the very first games on the Switch eShop, leading me and many other creators to talk, yell, shout, and scream about this future hidden gem as it instantly became one of the best games on the system. And I truly believe Blaster Master Zero played a key role, along with other indie games like Kamiko and Snake Pass, in building up the Nintendo Switch indie or Nindy scene to the point that it is today. Indies have become so integral to the success of the Switch, as well as the Switch giving indies an entirely new platform to thrive on. I mean, to the point where we do indeed have these entire directs dedicated to them. And that is why we are seeing now a sequel to an incredible game that I honestly never expected to see get a sequel. And now that I spent this entire window talking about the history of the game, I have to be pretty short on this next part. So let me just power through it. Blaster Master Zero 2 is everything you loved about the first game, but pumped full of steroids. I mean, it's almost like a freaking 16-bit version of Starlink in Metroidvania style. <laughs> you can fly to other planets now? What? They have crammed in so many new features and gameplay elements, and in my opinion, created a sequel 10 times better than the original. Both these Zero games are incredible, so grab both right now. Trust me. All right, we're halfway through the list at this point. All of those games were amazing and the last half are just as amazing. This is by far one of my favorite eShop lists I've done and we're not slowing down because next we have Sundered. Sundered begins in a vicious sandstorm. As you push your way through the sand, your character slowly comes into view. The sound design here really took me by surprise. Playing this game with headphones on, it's like I just paid some website $10 to listen to high quality nature sounds. It's not actually plugged in anything and I can't hear anything. That's better. And then both the animations and that sound design really set the tone for the rest of your experience in this game as the entire world rises up and starts crumbling around you. You fall down into a cave surrounded by gorgeous jungle and this is where you start your wonderful Metroidvania experience filled with hand-drawn art and solid gameplay. Action and exploration is key and the fun piles in tenfold as you start unlocking new weapons and abilities like a grappling hook, boots that allow you to run up walls, or big hunking energy guns. Oh, and these boss battles? Well, most to all of them anyway, feel like 2D Shadow of the Colossus style gameplay as you attempt to take down huge enemies that fill the whole screen while you run around them like a tiny ant. There are randomly generated elements to this game too, making different playthroughs feel fresh and even mixing up your current game as you play it. And those that have played Dead Cells will already be very familiar with the upgrade system. At the start, you'll find death around every corner 
corner, but the more you play and collect shards, when you die, you get to upgrade yourself and your abilities, making the next go around just that much easier. If nothing else has convinced you to pick up this game, then do so just to marvel at the gorgeous art style. I feel like my cat just broke something. What did you do? Whatever. I'm taking these off too. Toe Jam and Earl are finally back. Specifically, they're back in the groove, which is the name of the game. And that kind of sounds like a song. I retire. I have been so excited to talk about this game for weeks, or at least since whenever I got the code for it, and I have been dying to make this video. I was one of those weirdo kids that actually much preferred the first Toe Jam & Earl over the second one. I say weirdo because most people I talked to liked the side-scrolling platformer version of Toe Jam & Earl, which was the second game, and not many people I knew actually liked the what the heck even is this game that was the first one. But for me, I had side-scrolling games aplenty as a kid and I loved how different the first Toe Jam and L was from anything I had played. From there, fast forward to 2019, ignoring that before mentioned sequel and also ignoring the third game. Yes, there was one. No, we don't talk about it. And now finally, Toe Jam and L is back and, and truly they are back, back in the groove the same way they were originally the way I liked them in, in the first game. Going back to the game's roots and giving us a unique experience in a strange genre that no other developer wants to touch. Marooned on a strange planet, you go up and down through levels in a just for some reason in the middle of nowhere elevator trying to find pieces of your ship so you can get the heck out of weirdo town. Back in the groove will hit you with 90s nostalgia whether you played the first games or not. That funky bass slapping music will slap you right in the face with 90s nostalgia and the squiggly lines will make you want to drink a cool drink from a 90s cup of water. And while I will say for me, the overall world's art direction didn't make the choices I would have made, it just kind of feels a little bland and flat to me. But you cannot deny the comparisons in the visuals to many of your favorite old school cartoons. And as you explore the 25 randomly generated levels collecting parts for your ship, you will meet a huge array of different characters. And there's also a ton of different presents to find, each of which have extremely varying items and abilities, and just at its core, it's fun. Really fun. It's just one of those games that you don't want to put down until you've gone through every level and collected every piece of your ship. And if you die, you just want to start it again because you you know you can do it. Playthroughs are short, just a couple hours or so, but no two playthroughs ever feel the same. And you can play co-op, which makes it a lot more fun, actually. Did you guys ever watch that amazing 90s movie, Baby's Big Day Out? I think it was the 90s. Well, you remember that gorilla scene? Do you ever wonder what would happen if he actually broke out of that cage and went on a rampage? That's pretty much what Ape Out is. Actually, funny enough, Ape Out is a pretty similar game to 12 is better than 6 in concept, but at the same time, it feels completely different to play and screams its own unique, big, bold, angry personality. It's another game that gives you little to no instruction. Just break out of that cage and do your best to survive. It'll teach you most of the things you need to know in the first two seconds of playing the game. In this fast-paced, action-packed, blood-filled, monkey-raging adventure, you play as an ape who needs to break out of his crummy situation and tear the limbs off every deserving person who kept this majestic creature caged up for so long. There's actually quite a lot of depth to the gameplay here, despite only having to use a couple buttons. Explode enemies on impact or send them flying, grab them and use them as a human shield while they panic and fire into their enemies. Rip doors off their hinges and use them as protection from bullets or just throw the doors and squish the bad guys with them. You can throw enemy grenades right back at their stupid faces. Again, so much depth to the gameplay. Also, also, I really admire the visuals here and the fact that it's clearly a top-down game but they still manage to hide everything behind these walls. It actually works really well, both visually and from a gameplay standpoint. Not knowing what's around every corner like you usually would in any other top-down game, it leaves you having to make constant split-second decisions to stay alive and makes just running around the levels more like a fun maze. And by far, the best part about this game is the music. Heavy drums will bang through each level with the actions you make, picking up tempo the more you destroy and symbols crashing on every enemy kill. Oh, and this game can be really challenging at times, but it's always great to play and great to listen to. Finally, Final Fantasy IX and VII are on Nintendo Switch, and I mean finally in two ways. One, 
finally they're on Switch, as I said, and two, finally I get to play Final Fantasy IX again. First time since my childhood. And I know this game has been around for a while on consoles, but for me, the Switch is where it finally made sense to play it again. And yeah, of course 7 is on here as well. Honestly, I can't remember 7 at all. For some reason, I really resonated with 9 when I was younger. The characters of Zidane, Vivi, and Garnett were my favorites from any Final Fantasy game. Zidane reminded me of Goku with his tail, and he had that rebellious teenager thing going for him, so I thought he was super cool. Vivi is by far the best Final Fantasy character hands down, and I don't care what you say, look at him and his pointy little hat. He is adorable and super OP with his spells. And you know, Garnet. I was like 14 at the time, but I thought she was really cute, but still. Also, for me at the time, the animations and cutscenes in 9 just looked incredible. I was always floored by how stunning the cutscenes looked, and they really helped bring the characters' personalities to life. And even to this day, I feel like Final Fantasy IX has some of the most enjoyable turn-based RPG gameplay I have played. Visually, it holds up great in my opinion. The pre-rendered backgrounds still look amazing. Well. Most of them anyway. They're like hand-painted artworks being used as backdrops for the action in the foreground. And in this updated version, which I'm sure has been around for a while, but it's so much cleaner than the original. The character models are crisp and they look great. And I really don't think there's anything to hate here. It's one of the best JRPGs of all time. It's one of the best games of all time. And no, I don't know why 7 costs less than 9, but in my opinion, both of them are worth 20 bucks anyway. So the fact that one's cheaper is... I mean, I guess that's a plus. And I know that this was very heavily Final Fantasy IX focused. Again, it's been a long time since I played Seven, and I wasn't too worried about going in depth with Seven. Because I mean, does anyone watching this not hear about how great Final Fantasy Seven is like every week of their lives? But I will say that once I'm done with Nine, and right now I'm literally on the last few bosses, I will be diving into Seven again. So maybe I'll talk about it more down the line. For now, Seven still counts as one on this list, as does Nine. I highly recommend both. Let's just move along. <laughs> And that is another 10 really great games on the eShop. Again, I think this is definitely one of the best lists I've done. And again, if you want to win a limited edition Hob Nintendo Switch, like seriously, there's not going to be many of these out there in the world. This is actually pretty exciting. Make sure to enter to win that Switch. I'm really excited for one of you. With all that being said, if you like this video or you learned a little something, make sure you have flip all over that subscribe button. No, that's cool, panic button. It's cool. We're still friends. It's whatever.